The Toyota Camry, a Consumer's Digest Best Buy and the number one selling car in America two years in a row. That, that is the kind of car Toyota wanted to sell us in the early 2000s. And they did. I mean, they've sold millions of the things, making Toyota a boatload of money. But there was a problem. Toyota wasn't viewed then as a hot, young, youthful brand where the engineers and designers used words like passion, performance, and sex. And the Prius, well, let's just say it didn't really help convince anyone otherwise. I mean, Nissan was marketing their new Z. Honda had just shocked the world with the long-awaited S2000. Both Subaru and Mitsubishi were wide open throttle building adrenaline-fueled rally fighters. Hell, even Suzuki was making cars that, while not pulse-pounding, at least they were interesting. So what in the world was Toyota gonna do with their Prius problem? Well, you know what they say, it takes a village. And in Toyota's case, it took both the help of Subaru and $300 million to bring the brand back to the upper echelon of Japanese sports cars with the now iconic trio that is the 86, the BRZ, and the FRS. And though the three cars have some differences, their spiritual predecessor is the same, an iconic car you know as the AE86. This is the story of the Toyobaru BR86. Toyota's history is rich, to say the least. You see, the 80s and 90s weren't just a golden age for automotive engineering in Europe. This colorful and culturally evolving era was also the ideal time for fans of simple, entry-level sports cars from all around the world. And especially in Japan. Toyota offered wonderful little cars that weren't only affordable, but true driver's machines. The Celica, Supra, Corolla, the MR2, all reasonably priced sports cars that had varying degrees of performance that anyone could hop into and hone their skills as a driver. But then it all changed. Enter Camry, RAV4, and Prius, and exit car enthusiast hope in Toyota sports cars. While it is true that these 2000s models massively helped create the now gigantic size of Toyota's corporate and financial status, the real car people felt left behind. For the North American market, Toyota spun up Scion. And for the rest of the world in 2007, Toyota made an attempt to light a fire under the seats of younger car buyers with a concept car, dubbed the FTHS. The name needed some work, but it was a front-engine hybrid V6-powered rear-wheel drive coupe with exciting styling to say the least. And though no plans were set in stone, the FTHS concept did the job of getting enthusiasts buzzing about a possible return to form for Toyota's sports car segment. Just a year later, a big merger was underway, when Toyota bought a $300 million stake at Fuji Heavy Industries, the parent company of Subaru. This collab brought together the respected, reliable brand of Toyota with the face of all-wheel drive utility in Subaru. And nobody thought a sports car would pop out of that mix. But against all odds, a pitch for a two-door rear-drive car with the agenda to address the fact that people weren't only losing interest in Toyota, but in cars as a whole, got greenlit. And this is where the Toyobaru triplets were born. So where do you start on such an ambitious project? Well, you get an ambitious engineer. Enter Tetsuya Tada. Tada had been a chassis engineer within the company for a couple decades at this point, and though his work at the time was specifically with uh, minivans, Tada's ultimate dream, like many of us, was to build the perfect enthusiast machine. Among the team, there were several other chassis engineers, one of which was rumored to be absolutely obsessed with the famed Corolla AE86 of the 1980s, meaning that from the beginning, the new Toyota sports car was going to be a lightweight champion with a specialty in the handling department. There was almost no oversight in the form of benchmarks or targets for the 86 project other than that it had to be rear-wheel drive. And almost immediately, the bosses started questioning Tata and his team's ability to create a desirable car without having specific track times, horsepower, and acceleration figures to shoot for. But Tata knew what he was doing. To cool things off with upper management, he had executives drive early prototypes of what would become the GT86. And let's just say their concerns were taken care of. This was never, ever going to be a numbers car. It wasn't going to be concerned with turning a lap faster, braking harder, or pumping out more power than its competitors. It was going to be something people loved because how it feels. Just like the AE86, it drew inspiration from. Like the AE86, it was front engine and rear wheel drive, but it was from another Toyota sports car that the team would find the way forward in terms of a power plant. See, Toyota has built some of the most legendary engines in the world, 
but at this exact moment in time, none of them off the shelf would hit the power and packaging targets the engineers had in mind, and all of them were way too tall. Tata and fellow project engineer Yoshinori Sasaki looked all the way back to the 1960s at the Toyota Sports 800, a tiny little front engine rear drive coupe that had, of all things, a boxer engine. The flat layout of the Sport 800's engine gave it incredible chassis feel because it could be mounted close to the ground, giving the car a low center of gravity. Knowing this, and realizing Toyota didn't have any engines on the shelf that were short enough to fit under the low slung hood of their new Canyon Carver with maybe the little bonus that they were now in bed with Subaru, the crazy idea for a boxer in their new sports car was confirmed. But there was a problem. The relationship between Subaru and Toyota was less than ideal to say the least. Subaru wasn't interested in co-developing anything, and they weren't too excited about lending Toyota an engine either. That is, until Tata and the team built a prototype based on a Subaru Legacy and lent them the car. Subaru's management came back and said, You know what's weird? Every time we lend it out, it comes back with the rear tires completely bald. And just like that, the project was back on. But there was still a problem. Subaru was on board to lend them engines, but Toyota had a goal of 100 horsepower per liter, outputting less than 160 grams per kilometer of carbon dioxide emissions without using a turbocharger. To meet emissions goals, power levels dropped to just 60 horsepower per liter. Simply not enough. So Tata phoned a friend, namely Harahiko Tanahashi. You know, the chief engineer of the Lexus LFA, who discovered with the correct bore and the use of Toyota's D4S fuel injection system, it could be done. But Toyota would have to share the inner workings of it with Subaru, a system they'd spent millions of dollars developing, given away to a competitor for free? Well, that was never gonna happen. And it almost didn't. To add fuel to the fire, Subaru was adamantly against using direct injection in their engines, as they simply had never been able to make it work properly. Once again, the project was stalled. Until Toyota's head of engine development, Shinzo Kabuki, got involved. Kabuki was the very man that had developed the engine in the original AE86, and if there was anyone that could smooth things over between the two companies, it was him. The end result was Toyota gave over the tech and agreed to handle any and all warranty issues that came as a result. Finally, the two companies combined their expertise to create the heart of Tata's new car, and in 2011, at the Tokyo Motor Show, Toyota unveiled what would become possibly the single most important sports car of the new century, the GT86. Subaru got the rights to sell their version of the same car, dubbed the BRZ. Toyota would sell theirs as the GT86, and in America, Scion sold it as the FRS. Once the automotive media got their hands on it, we found that the car could do a 0-60 to 60 in around 6.7 seconds, and the quarter mile in 14.7. Not quick, and not particularly fast, but again, that's not what the Toyobaru was concerned with. And it was a hit. When it went on sale the following year in 2013, they sold over 27,000 units between the different brands in the first year. But wait a second. The BRZ, GT86, and FRS can't really all be the same car, can they? Well... Yes, but no. They share the same chassis, engine, and basic parts from each other, and certainly look related, minus some brand-specific restyling. And they're all manufactured in a Subaru plant. But there were some tuning-related changes between the set that gave buyers their pick of the litter. The BRZ's suspension was slightly more tied down and leaned into the stable grip capabilities of the chassis, while the GT86 and FRS models favored a more playful and tossable setup that allowed drivers to really find the edge of the car's limits. And after just a few years of production, people were addicted. Its nimble little Prius spec tires, direct steering feel, and near perfect weight distribution meant this thing was predictable and an absolute riot in all the best ways. Not to mention the price was and is still attractive as hell. Though Scion went defunct in 2015, Toyota took over to sell the FRS in the US, but officially renamed the car back to its roots as the 86, completing what is truly a heartwarming full circle moment in automotive history. And the two remaining twins aren't done yet. Both the 86 and the BRZ went on to be refreshed for a brand new generation at the beginning of the 2020s. 
both sporting a little more power, a little more handling prowess, and some more styling. All of which had been called for by enthusiasts for years since the BRZ and 86 first showed their aggressive little faces 10 years ago. But what the trio of sports cars did most important is give a new generation of car enthusiasts a chance to understand what driving is all about. It gave young people a segment of cars they could actually acquire, one that didn't exist when they were young, and one that brings out the joy of being in complete control of an automobile. Thank you, Toyo Brew. And thank you all for watching. Consider subscribing to Ideal. Go check out some of the other automotive stories just like this one right over here, and I'll see you all in the next one.